Andrews. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Louis Andrews. I'm the director and president of OVO Network, and it's with great pleasure that I'll be talking about team culture today, uh, which is a uh, an interesting talk for me because usually I give talks that are more based on hard earned and worked on data, whereas this one is kind of more of a ambiguous, abstract idea, but it's some, one that I think is really important to our network success. And I kind of want to share with you some of my experience with regards to team culture, why it's important, why we value it, and why we think that you should too. So, a quick introduction to uh, Ovo Network for those of you that don't know us. So Ovo Network is uh, a business consultancy uh, program as well as a, a booking platform. Um, we have 180 high-end chalets uh, that work with us on an exclusive basis. Our average booking value is 4,000 euros. Um, our direct uh, percentage of bookings is at 80%, which is... Uh, pretty high considering that the uh, industry averages are 3% in the urban market and 30% in the leisure market. Um, in 2022, we were also the second highest rated uh, host in Europe on Airbnb. Um, here's a picture of some of our properties. So we're very much, uh, we're specified in a very particular niche, which is uh, the Northern French Alps currently. Um, and that's just to give you an idea of the type of property that we have on our portfolio. So, um, in 1978, uh, Tony Wilson founded Factory Records in Manchester. And Tony Wilson's first act that he signed was Joy Division. And when he signed Joy Division, uh, they were at the back of a pub in Manchester. And Tony Wilson took out a knife and he cut open his hand and with the blood taken from his hand, he wrote on the back of a napkin, the musicians own everything, the company owns nothing, all our bands have the freedom to F off. It's interesting company culture. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of the type of business that Tony Wilson was, was running. So uh, shortly after Ian Curtis, the lead singer of Joy Division, commits suicide, um, the remaining members of the band decide to form a new uh, band called New Order that you've probably all heard of, hopefully. Maybe not Richard Vorton, but that's fine. Um, and, <laughs> and New Order's first single is uh, Blue Monday. And uh, the creative director of Factory Records is a man called Peter Saville. And he designs the cover of Blue Monday to, be, to cost more uh, to produce than the money they get back from selling it. Now, they thought that seeing as the lead singer just committed suicide, nobody, nobody would buy this record, and it ended up being one of the best sold out uh, records of all time in the UK at the time, meaning that they lost a lot of money. So no surprise that in 1992, factory records go bankrupt, and Tony Wilson is quoted as saying, we made history, not money. Now, slightly less rock and roll <laughs> is the short-term rental industry, <laughs> but we can change that together. Um, one thing about our history which is quite interesting, I think, is that in 2008, uh, we basically came up with the business idea for the, uh, for, the, for the business. 2008 is still a time when Airbnb are making cereal boxes. Um, and we, on the back of an A4 sheet of paper, in pen, not in blood, come up with an idea which is, OK, well, we've got loads of properties around us in the French Alps. They're empty all the time. People hate cold beds. We want to share uh, our sector. We want to share our environment with people, we want people to come to our resorts, let's set up a business and get people to come and stay in our chalets. And what happened, it was, it was a very slow, natural progression. So we basically were knocking on neighbors' doors, signing properties, and I like to call this time, which is from 2010, let's say, to 2020, uh, the time where we were running the business as a lifestyle business. So it was around the kitchen table, people were around the world, the amount of money that was being injected into it was just the money left over from the housekeeping, and we were kind of growing naturally. Um, what's interesting, though, is that this chart shows the five phases of growth. So there's papers that have been written about this, and I think it's quite interesting. And basically, they determine that there's five main different stages of growth, creativity, direction, delegation, coordination, co collaboration. And then every time, with regards to each phase, there's also a revolution 
which in turn creates the next phase, but also the next problem that you have to resolve. So interestingly, right now, I say that OVO network, we're in phase three of OVO network. But that's regardless of this chart. I just say we're at phase three. First, phase one was 2010 to 2020. So phase two was during the COVID time, which was obviously a different time than we're in now. I think we've understood that today. And now we're in phase three. And interestingly, it fits perfectly uh, with uh, this chart here as well, because we're very much in the delegation period. So we've grown as a company to 180 properties. We've got a large team. We've got people based full-time in France as full-time employees, but we've got people all around the world as well, which means that we're a team of about 50 people. And right now, uh, sadly, the management team can't clone ourselves any further than we already have, meaning that we need to start delegating uh, tasks and roles to other people. And that's the challenge that we're facing right now. So the really important part, the, the most important part, I think, in team culture is going to be recruitment. And obviously, what you want to do is to make sure that you can grow and that you can delegate and that you're happy to do so and that there's trust to do so is you need to recruit well. So one thing that we realized kind of around 2020 is we wanted to be really, really hard and difficult in terms of how we recruited people. So these are the phases that we go through. So there's an open call. There's then a screening interview, there's then a culture interview to make sure that people have shared similar values or at least don't have totally contrasting values to us. There's then a verbal, numerical and abstract tests. If you want to know my results to these tests, I'll happily share them with you. I didn't score as well as Jess, my colleague who's somewhere. I did get the exact same score as Rafi though. So that's interesting. Uh, we then have a team interview to make sure that the new recruits gets on with the team member themselves and then bang, they're part of uh, over a network. Um, interestingly, Will, Ben, and Emily touched on this a bit, and this is just a mandatory uh, basketball quote that I need to get in all my presentations, but um, this quote about failure from Michael Jordan, which is actually a quote by Nike writing it from Michael Jordan, but works quite well, is about seeking out discomfort and being out of your com uh, comfort zone and uh, embracing failure, which is kind of something that Will was referring to earlier on today. And I think that failure is something that we really, really want to push forwards in our company culture. And when I mean failure, it doesn't mean, okay, let's just make sure that we're rubbish at everything. It means let's make sure that we're not afraid to fail. Because if we're not afraid to fail, that's how we can push things forwards and that's how we can make an environment in which people are feeling confident to thrive in. Because again, going back to delegation, that's kind of what we want to get our employees to embody is that confidence in themselves and their ideas and the company itself allowing them to take risks and to have ideas and share ideas. And that's how we're going to grow in the phase of growth that we're in now, is that we can't do it all by ourselves. We need to do it together. And it's only with strong company culture that we're going to achieve that. So what we've got here is um, taken from a book that's called Surrounded by Idiots. And Gail, who's not in this room, who's in the other room, was telling me earlier that one thing that she's understood is that everybody's stupid. <laughs> And that's quite interesting because this book that's called Surrounded by Idiots at face value seems like it's saying the exact same thing. It's saying we're all surrounded by idiots. I know better than all of you. You're all idiots. Now, that's what you think at face value. But as you learn and you read into the book, you realize that what Thomas Erickson, the author of the book, has done is he's basically um, splits every person into four different categories. Now, obviously, there's always exceptions to the rule, et cetera, et cetera. But usually, all of you shall be able to, to identify yourselves as one of these four colors. Now, interestingly, depending on the role that you occupy within your company, it's, I can usually guess. So if you're a CEO, you'll probably be more red. If you're a revenue manager, you'll definitely be more blue. And if you're a, uh, an employee that's kind of along for the ride and happy to contribute in any way possible, you'll be green. And if you're a, a good salesperson, like Carol, who's somewhere here, I think, is uh, you'll be very uh, relationship orientated and you'll be a yellow. So back to the whole idea of being surrounded by idiots. Um, this, is, this played kind of a really major part in the way that I learned how to recruit people and how to manage people. Um, I have a colleague called uh, Justin Hullett, who's not here today, who's a ginger American French person. And uh, he's, he's a clear yellow. He's the most yellow person I've ever met in my entire life. And I identify as more of a red. I get extremely offended if people say I'm not red, but I'm, which means that I'm a red. So I'm a red and a blue. 
So ambitious, blah, 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 but also detail orientated. And interestingly, Justin, in a lot of the ways that he acts and a lot of the ways that he comes up with ideas and does things, is often the total opposite of how I'd have done them. So surrounded by idiots. I look at Justin and I go, what the hell are you doing? And for about the first year of him working for us, I'm going, Justin, there's about 15 spelling mistakes in your five word message to me on Slack. Come on, get your stuff together. However, over time, and this is through experience of throwing Justin into the fire, what I realized is that I absolutely admire and respect Justin more than most of my colleagues. And that's because he's different to me. And this is kind of where I'm trying to get to in, with regards to Surrounded by Idiots, is that we're actually not, we shouldn't all be red, we shouldn't all be blue, we shouldn't all be green, we, should, we shouldn't all be yellow, because we're complementary. And what I'd advise you to do in reading this book is, it's, it's, from, it's written from a management perspective. So it's how to manage people that are of a different color than you. So if you've got somebody that's not detail-oriented and that's very much relationship-driven, how do you manage that? How do you make sure that you're playing to their strengths and putting them in positions of power and empowerment? empowerment sorry. Um, this is Project Aristotle by Google. It's the second uh, uh, project by Google that's been mentioned today because Richard Vorton mentioned one earlier. So Google do... Google have way too much money and therefore luckily spend some of that money on case studies and learning more about their team and learning more about how to manage their teams. And what they did is that uh, they ran Project Aristotle, which was a look at their team's efficiency and productivity. So how did they do that? Well, basically what they did is that they uh, ran reports and they interviewed their team and they asked uh, team leaders, so CEOs, well, company leaders, so CEOs, etc., team leaders that of teams and team members, uh, what they valued the most within the company. And then they compared that with the data of the most successful companies. And interestingly, what they found was that the most important thing, according to Google and at Google, is psychological safety. So what's psychological safety? Well, psychological safety is what I was saying earlier. It's the feeling that you're safe enough in your role and in your team to take risks and to have ideas. And I think that's really important is we need to surround ourselves and make sure that people do feel safe and have those ideas. Dependability means that you know that you can depend on your colleagues to make sure that they're going to give things in on time and they're going to respect deadlines and they're going to respect you. Structure and clarity is do I know what my role is? Am I going to be applying my role? Do you know what your role is? very important. Meaning, do I have a sense of meaning? And meaning can be, am I earning enough money to feed my family? But it can also mean, is my, is my team reliant on me enough and do they believe in me? In the same way that impact is another thing that we would kind of want to add here, which is, as it says here, team members think their work matters and creates change. That can be on different scales, obviously. It can be on a company-wide scale. It can be on a worldwide scale. It can be on a team scale. So regardless, team members often want to make sure and feel like they're making an impact on the people surrounding them. And so these are the key values that Google tries to apply and make sure is existent in all of their team spaces and team works. Now, interestingly, what they'd assumed before doing this study is that things like uh, where people were geography, geographically, um, their age, uh, how long they'd worked at the company, they thought these would be huge, majorly important factors in this study. And the results said actually that they're not important at all. So you can put somebody that's really young with somebody that's older, you can put somebody that's been with the company uh, for ages and somebody that's new. As long as these things are in place, they found that those teams had success. What I'll add on top of this, and this is kind of my, one of my key words at the moment, is accountability. So accountability for me is this idea that, especially with the team leaders, because again, we're talking about delegation, is I want to make sure that the team, main, the team leaders feel that they're accountable and they're held accountable and they're held responsible for the projects that they're leading, because that's what basically empowers them. That's what fills them with confidence and that's what, what assures them that they're going in the right direction. And obviously, team culture is also really in interesting and really important with regards to loyalty. I was asking my colleagues earlier on uh, yesterday, I was saying, what do you think is the most important thing about team culture from a CEO's perspective? Why should the CEO care? How does it affect the bottom line? And the reality is that loyalty plays a huge part in this because 
one thing is that if you're delegating uh, and you're, you're wanting to trust your team leaders, if that team leader then quits their job and goes to another company, well, they've then lost that part of your business that was really important for you because you trusted them and you know that they could lead uh, their team. So obviously you want to avoid the churn rate and the loyalty and the team culture aspect for loyalty is something that's really strong. Um, this photo is us also going to a music festival, which helps is those little perks, for example, Rafi's about to go to Bali uh, for three months. That also helps. That creates loyalty because the employees know that they're appreciated and we respect them. Uh, and it's uh, slightly different to people just rocking up for a nine to five and doing their work in that way. So loyalty is a huge part of team culture. And I think it's a big reason why you want to enforce and make sure that there is a really strong team culture within your organization. And that's kind of the, the foundation work. So, Earlier again during uh, Will, Ben and Emily's uh, uh, interaction just here, uh, one of the questions from Emily was the motivation to scale. And that kind of got me thinking about what our motivation to scale was, because obviously we're at scale rentals, so there's a motivation to scale. And for me, I think it's two things. It's the belief in our product, because as we know, we've got a strong product and we really want to push that forwards. But it's also the people. It's the trust in the people that I work with, and it's wanting to grow with them. And what's important about that is that I know that we're only going to be able to scale if we're surrounded by the right people. Because if we're not surrounded by the right people and we're just doing it ourselves as a management team, we're never going to go anywhere, and we're not going to grow, and we're not going to scale. And that's obviously the contrary to what we want to do. We want to make sure that the foundation work is in place in order to allow us to get to that next level of growth. Um, this is a slight reference to uh, Scale Rentals Barcelona two years ago, where we were talking about the difference between scaling and growing, because it's something that kind of struck a chord with me. So just to kind of clarify on that, scaling is adding one new team member for every new property that you add, whereas growing is adding four. And I think that that's quite interesting as a way for us to position ourselves, especially here at scale, is I think that more and more, if you're recruiting the right people, if you're establishing the right team culture, you're going to be able to scale instead of growing. And obviously, scaling is going to be much more cost effective than growing because you're going to have less staff. And not everyone wants thousands of staff. <coughs> um, here's a quote from Rafi Klein. Uh, this quote is taken from her very first interview ever with Ovo Network three years ago. And this was literally within one minute of talking with her. Uh, I asked Rafi to describe herself, and she said, I'm persistent. Who is, uh, I'm someone who is very ambitious. I set myself very high goals, and I'm very persistent. That was a terrible accent, sorry. Um, and that was really interesting. And so we asked her to give us feedback on our website at the time. And Rafi said that she felt like the brand image is not in line with the product and service you're providing. You're all about quality over quantity. But I feel like the website doesn't translate that. And I feel like Rafi was spot on when she said that. However, at the time, we didn't realize that. And obviously, with the fact that we've got 80% direct bookings and we're trying to grow that even more, it's really important for us to have a strong direct website. So what's amazing, and this is why the persistency thing is key and I think is part of team culture and part of something that you really want to make sure that your team members have, is that Rafi took this project once we hired her. She never forgot the fact that she thought uh, our brand image was terrible. And she basically reworked it. And she worked at it for a very long time. And we led a lot of battles with other members of the management team who basically refused to see any value in doing a rebrand and any value in making our website look good. They thought that you know, a website that looked like it was made in 1999 was fine. But I kind of disagree. So luckily, Rafi never gave up. She was persistent. And she continued and she carried on. And uh, I don't know, when was it? In June? In June, we launched our rebrands. And we've had so many good, positive feedback after that rebrand. And it's something that we're really proud of now. And we've already had feedback from partners that are saying, we want to work with you because of the strength of your brand. And that's all down to Rafi's persistency. So well done to her. Um, obviously, again, we're at the stage of growth, which is delegation. And as I was saying earlier, the foundation work is really important. But the other thing that I'll just is worth, I think, mentioning is the fact that we're also trying to figure out how to plan and how, how to prioritize at the minute. And that's something that we've still not totally set on in the sense that 
we even right now we're still kind of running that lifestyle business of just going full steam ahead and not really planning things and prioritizing things in the right way, which means that we're not as efficient as I'd like us to be. So a team culture is one part of that, the answer to that and what's going to allow us to get to the next stage of growth. But I think the other part is the planning and prioritization of it. So this is just a quick graph to say that what we're trying to do more and more now, now that we've got the team in place, is to make sure that we're setting goals, that we're budgeting, super important, that we're planning, that we're actioning, that we're adjusting, evaluating, feedbacking, improving, and then repeat. And I think that whilst it seems like really eight really easy steps with some nice pretty emojis, it actually took us, what, 12 years to get to this point where we're like, oh, we actually need to start becoming more serious about some of this stuff. And again, you need the right team to be able to ap apply some of this as well. So looking ahead is really important. And hopefully, I've talked to quite a few of you actually, and I feel like some of you know exactly where you're going and some of you, like I'm not mentioning any names, I have no idea. And that's fine, but I'd really, really like definitely advise you to try and think, okay, well, where are we heading? Where are we gonna be in five years? Where are we gonna be in 10 years? And that can be from a company perspective, but also on a personal perspective. I often ask my colleagues, where do you see yourself in one year? Where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? And as an employer, sometimes that's quite interesting because the response that you're gonna get is not necessarily always the one that you wanna hear. So somebody's gonna say, well, in 10 years, I'll be, I don't know, living in Kuala Lumpur uh, with, with my own business, okay? Well, as an employer, you're like, oh, I want you to spend your whole entire life working for me. But the reality is that they're not gonna do that always. And having that clarity and, and kind of daring to ask that question it actually ends up being really positive because at least it allows you to know where you're heading and you make sure that you're heading somewhere as a collective rather than as lots of individuals. Um, but it's also important to enjoy the ride. So this is a quote from, spoiler alert, from the last uh, episode ever of The Office where Andy says, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. And this is something that, again, really struck a chord with me because I'm 28 years old. Uh, my two colleagues that are here uh, with me today are also 28 and 27 years old. And I consider ourselves to be incredibly lucky with regards to the opportunities that we've been given and the fact that we're even here today. I'm really, really happy with that. And I'm really happy with the team culture that we've managed to establish at Ovo Network. And I'm really proud and thankful of where we've also managed to all the things that we've managed to achieve in large part thanks to that team culture of, yeah, okay, we work together, but we also live together and, and have drinks together and have meals together, big French meals, and it's lovely. And <laughs> my point here is that I therefore think that we're very lucky to uh, basically be in the good old days. And at the same time, you know, this too shall pass. So at some point we won't be in the good old days anymore or we'll be in different good old days. But I'm really appreciative of the fact that I know that I am currently in the good old days and I'm very lucky about that. And I think that I, I know that my colleagues, a lot of my colleagues feel the same and it's just a really nice place to be when you wake up in the morning and you know that your colleagues are waking up in the morning and everyone wants to go to work and be together, which may be foreign but to some people, but is something that we have the privilege of experiencing every day. Um, and finally, I think the final key here is that team culture will create and breed innovation. Um, as it says on the quote here, if everyone is moving forwards together, then success takes care of itself. And I'll kind of end on this note, but I think it's important to say is that I'm gonna give you a kind of a firm example of why team culture can have such a strong impact to you guys. So last week we had a number of presentations uh, to our owners, so we were going in resort and we invited 33 of our owners to come over uh, to a cafe where we presented to uh, them for an hour the values of working with Ovo Network. So Jess did a presentation, Rafi did a presentation, I did a presentation. We were surrounded by our colleagues all together having a nice time and our owners were here. And the reality is that at Ovo Network we're actually going through an interesting time right now because we've identified that demand is increasing, sorry, offer is increasing and demand is going down in terms of people going on holiday. And what we've realized is that we're in a really strong position, but in order to maintain that strong position, we've got to do something that's very scary for clients, which is we're increasing our fees. So we're increasing our fees and we've got these 33 owners in front of us who are all, when they arrive at the event, ready to, to tear our heads off 
because we're about to increase their fees fairly significantly for certain bookings, for certain types of bookings. But thanks to the team culture, which is that Jess, Rafi, myself, and everyone else that was at this event, thanks to the fact that they, we buy into the service and the product that we offer, and we buy into our model, and we buy into what we do, at the end of the presentation where we're talking about our increase in fees to the owners, it finished with a roaring round of applause. And the owners were coming to us saying, well done, that was fantastic. I'm not sure how many people manage to get a round of applause when you're increasing your fees to people. Um, and that's kind of to just highlight the value. As, and I think that we wouldn't have been able to get that response if we ourselves didn't believe in ourselves, which is obviously all down to team culture. So that's kind of it. But I will finish on a quick note, which is uh, a poem. Because, I don't know, we're being a bit mad, aren't we, today? So uh, I'm just going to throw a quick slice of, po uh, of poetry into our day, which is a nice thought. Um, and this is a poem uh, written by, by my great, great, great uncle Danny. Uh, and it goes something along the lines of this. Everybody everywhere seeks happiness, it's true. But finding it and, keep, um, but finding it and keeping it seems difficult to do. Difficult because we think that happiness is found only in places where wealth and fame abound. And so we go on searching in palaces of treasure, seeking recognition and monetary treasure, unaware that happiness is just a state of mind within the reach of anyone who takes time to be kind. For in making others happy, you will be happy too, as the happiness you give away will return to shine on you. Thank you very much. <laughs>